<laughs> what is up, nerd friends? It is time for some soldering. XRA Pro is new to the market. It just came off a huge win at the DNC that was held at Thunder Alley this past weekend. So congratulations to Ryan Mayfield for his win in the Pro E-Buggy class. And uh, as well, uh, Spencer Rifkin came in third, and they were both running XR8 Pro uh, combos, so more about that later on. What we're going to touch on today is the basic setup of the speed control itself, uh, wire installation, as well as setup to the radio so that you can get it uh, in the car and up and running. So first things first, let's talk about the soldering equipment that we're going to be using. I use a chisel tip that is probably three to, I don't know, four millimeters. It's got a skinny side and a wide side. And I usually try to make sure that my iron is a little bit bigger than the wire that I'm working with. It's not just the same size. Speed control comes with 12 gauge wire. That's what we're gonna use for the install. Three motor wires, two power wires. They are all black. So we're gonna pay close attention to what we're doing as we get this all installed and keep things in order. On the edge of the speed control, the positions of the wires are marked as well so you can make it easy and they even give you the red shrink tubing on that positive to help make it easy. These are normally going to go in the A-scale buggies. I'm going to use this for a lot of testing and demos and stuff so I am going to make sure that my motor wires are pretty long so I'm going to just leave these full length for now. I'm going to do about half length on the motor wires and I'm or the, the battery wires rather and I'm going to be using an AMAS branded XT90 plug. Talk a lot about plugs on the tech support lines with folks as far as what plugs to use and I highly recommend the AMAS branded uh, XT series of plugs for the lower power stuff rock crawlers you can get away with the XT60s which are this uh, more normal size here and the XT90s are good for everything else if you're going big power stuff you can go all the way up to say XT150s and even bigger so the first thing I like to do is a little bit of solder tin on each one of these tabs to make sure that the solder flows now not too much one of the big things that you'll run into that kind of causes problems is that you'll have wire kind of floating in the solder and that will lead to poor connections solder is actually a very poor conductor you want the wire to touch directly on the surface of that you're soldering to not float in the solder so just a little bit of t surface tinning to keep things kind of nice and even. And for this setup, I'm gonna lay my motor wires off flat, but what I wanna do is because I'm using good old fashioned rosin core leaded solder, 60-40 lead tin, and it's a rosin core flux, not an acid flux, I'm gonna retin these wires. The speed controls that are sold international electronics in general all have lead-free solder in them, and it's not super fun to work with. It's kind of high temperature, and it doesn't flow real well. So to make things easier, if you get stuck using the lead-free solder, just make sure that you have some flux around, because that will make your life a whole lot easier. When I strip wires, I like to use strippers so you don't get too many frayed edges, and I just kind of give it a little nudge just to break the surface in a twist so that I'm not cutting into the wires because what will happen is you'll cut the edges and get a lot of frayed wires and that's kind of all bad so try to avoid that if you can if you can't the trick is twist these nice and tight and you'll usually pull most of that out oh, bad job pull most of the strands out because when you'll go to tin and solder the wires those strands will jump across and touch stuff and that's always bad and then I like to always, because there's one right there actually, so and that could have been from previous terrible work. And then when I tin the wires, I try to keep the wires sideways. When I tin my wires, I like to grab them in something so that they can lay flat or even lean down a little bit so that the solder doesn't want to pool up inside of the strands. So a little spring-loaded alligator clip, or uh, needle nose, what is that? Tweezers will do wonders for holding onto the wires and being your extra set of hands. Those third hands or a little tiny vise or even a pair of pliers with a rubber band wrapped around it, also very effective. And then a little bit on there and I try to make sure that I get it all the way around. Like that and the roll. Solder on the iron, wire in the solder, little roll, brushing that up. And then when you're soldering, you want to make sure that you always have 
uh, your solder cleaning situation for the solder iron. There, you can use the Brillo pads. I use the sponge with some slots in it so that it pulls all the dirt and grit off the solder. And then next thing, we're going to solder that onto the speed control itself. Now, you can see my pit mat is ruined time and time again. It's, it's good to put something down, a piece of plastic, flat mat, a little piece of plywood works wonders. That's why I have this for soldering connectors and stuff. But normally with the speed control being up here, this might go poorly. So I'm just going to do it on my bench. Again, a little bit of solder on there. And when I go, I want to apply a little bit of pressure and kind of gently roll that wire so that it goes down onto the surface of the solder tab and doesn't float in the solder. Same thing, a little bit of solder on the iron. And then I tend to, I get lucky because I always twist these wires the same direction so that it's always kind of a right-handed twist and it's always tightening the wire, never loosening it. That's kind of important to make sure that you don't make the wire full of solder as you install it. Because if you're twisting it kind of as it goes, it closes. All right, so take a good look in there. Make sure that and this is this never shows up very well. But what I'm looking for is a nice uniform finish along the edges. It's not a huge blob of solder. The wire is definitely down in the pocket, and I can see the clean edges everywhere. Sometimes when you get a cold solder joint, you'll see like a rough edge along the edges of those, and then these all look pretty good. Next up, my power wires. I'm going to do the same thing again where I trim the, the bits off. And then again, I do the stripping, you uh, give this a little crimp and then try to twist it as you remove it because that makes it nice and snug. Give that a nice pinch and a twist. And now, I if one has this red guy on it, so I'm gonna leave that on the positive for when I put the plug on so I try not to mess that up. Again, just applying a little bit of downward pressure and a twist. I didn't hit this with the solder beforehand, but it worked out normally. A little bit of fresh solder on there. Or as they say overseas, a solder, which I understand there's an L in there, but sometimes the L is silent. Like sometimes there's extra letters in words like aluminum, for example. All right, so again, giving a nice inspection there, making sure the edges and all that look nice and clean. They do, so we're good to go for moving forward. I'm gonna cut these probably about in half. These guys are marked as a negative and a positive side. It's molded right on the edges, but the way that I always like is this skinny side. It looks like a negative symbol, and it's always the negative side. Don't forget to put this piece on. Same thing like with the solder tabs on the speed control, a little bit of solder on your surface just to make things flow a little bit better. There are many ways to solder these plugs better than what I'm doing right now where you put your finger on there, but this is my one-handed method that works okay. And then what I'm doing is I'm laying the wire into the pocket and then gonna hit the iron with some fresh solder on the edge and then come lay that guy in there and push the wire down onto it it's important to get the wire down onto the surface i don't know if i've mentioned that or not but it's very important and then same thing on the other side this side's a little easier because you got the wire from the other side to hold it and you can do that without putting your finger immediately next to it I say that and I don't do it. All right. Oh, give it a little angle. There you go. And then again, give these a visual inspection. Just because you did it doesn't mean it's right. And you want to make sure that you got nice clean edges on all your solder joints and nothing's got a crease in it. Snap the in in insulator on there and you're good to go. I like it when my motor wires are all exactly the same length. It just looks cool, no particular reason. 
All right, same thing like before. I won't bore you with the details. So for most sensor motor setups, you want to go ABC, ABC every time. Sensor less, you can use the motor orientation of the A and the C to can dictate the direction. The X-Ray Pro has a super cool feature where you can actually switch to the pole. So if you want your wires to look ultra cool, you can do that. We'll get into that a little bit later. But for now, we're just going to get this motor wired up normally. Same thing like all the other connections. We're going to put a little bit of solder on the surfaces just so that things flow. And we're going to use minimal solder to make our connections. All right, C, B, A, A, B, C, there we go. The wires match, A to A, B to B, C to C. And sensor wire. It'll run sensorless, but what fun is that? Okay, so now that we have the speed control wired up, we are ready to do the basic install and the calibration. So you have everything installed in your vehicle. You're going to plug the speed control into the throttle channel on the receiver, which is number two. If you've never done this before, make sure it's number two. Sometimes these things aren't in the same order that you would assume. Some receivers have two number ones. And on this plug-in, there are markings that are kind of hard to see that will tell you the orientation. The negative wire will generally always go to the outside edge of any modern receiver. And like I said, speed control goes into number two, the throttle channel. Calibration process is where the speed control learns the outputs of your radios, throttle, neutral brakes, all that fun stuff, what I'll call your throttle control. You can turn it on and it'll function, but it's not going to be right. So you want to make sure that before you go driving anything around or doing any calibr or setting up with a programmer that you calibrate the speed control. If it's not calibrated and you have everything hooked up, it's not going to let your programming stuff work either. So calibration process is pretty straightforward. I'm going to show that to you now, but I'll explain it first. It involves holding down the little small set button, turning the speed control on, tapping some buttons and moving some stuff around as you go. Okay, so calibration process. You hold on the set button. Tap the power button, you hold it down until it starts to blink, let go, you tap it again to set the neutral, give it full throttle and hold, tap it again to set the full throttle, give it full reverse and hold, tap it again, it'll blink, and then you're all set. Once it gets done, calibration is complete. And we're ready to go. All right, so now you got, you got everything installed and you wanna do some programming changes, so let's talk about that next. I unplug the fan so that we don't have to listen to the fan worrying the whole time. But the, the programming device, you got to remove the little rubber doohickey that plugs in there. And the programmer is marked on the end for how that goes in. And you're going to plug this in the same thing. The front of the case is also marked. That guy goes in there and you'll just, if you have any problems where this won't start up or connect, just unplug the speed control from the receiver and make sure that your radio is turned on and that this is calibrated because if any of that stuff's not jiving it's not going to be happy i'm going to leave my radio off for this because this particular receiver when it's not getting it just does nothing so so you fire it up and then you got to tap the button and that'll get the whole process started and move this back a little bit so we can there we go Once it connects, you're going to show you the profile that it's in, and then it gets to the first setting, the running mode. And for most folks, if you're looking to turn your reverse on, this is the place that you're going to do it. You change the items by pushing item, and you change the value of the item with the value button. And you can do that up or down, and then you can hit enter to save. So, for example, we can go through them here, we can go through them here, and then we want to get to the one that we want, and we hit enter to save. It says it's all right. So we move on to our next item in the list, and that is our reverse force. That's pretty self-explanatory. It's how strong your reverse is. Lipo cells is the number of cells that it's looking for when it's plugged in. So if you plug in a different voltage battery, it'll know. If you're running different batteries, you can leave this on auto. This vehicle will be getting run with all four cells. So I'm gonna set this to actual four cells and hit okay. The data saves okay. We go on to the next item. And the voltage cutoff being set to auto is fine. That's very safe. If you have a specific voltage that you want your batteries to cut off at, you can use this to set that here. 
Next one is our thermal protection, and you can see that you can disable that or enable that, which is always very nice. I leave them enabled just for safety. If I run into a thermal protection, it usually means something's wrong. There's one for the motor and for the speed control. So it's like an early warning system. You don't want to rely on your temperature protection. If your temperature protection kicks in, it usually means something's going south. After that, we got BC voltage. That's adjustable all the way up to 8.4 volts. Most of my servos are all normal voltage, so I leave that alone. And then sensor mode is if you're using non hobby wing motors or maybe a very old hammered on motor or you're using a sensor less motor you can put this in the hybrid mode and that'll work great for that moving on to the motor rotation this is for the forward direction of the motor if you want to change your forward to clockwise you can use this menu to do that so some of the vehicles have backwards transmissions and that's what that's for um, a, the phase AC swap before we were talking about how the you can make the wires look super cool and this is what that does it allows you to run the A and the C wires on the motor opposite each other for super cool installs but if you do that wrong you have all sorts of bad things happen so make sure you wire that correctly swap this and don't turn it on until everything is set correctly because it's very important the throttle rate is how linear the throttle is all the way up is most linear if you have Real twitchy throttle finger, you need to soften up a little bit. Throttle rate will help you do that if you have that ratchet throttle situation happening. A throttle curve is tunable. There is a customizable curve that with the USB link program and a PC or using the OTA device and your smart app, the curves are adjustable. So you can select between the two curves here. Linear is the standard. Neutral range is your dead band of your throttle. So if you have inconsistent drag brake, inconsistent reverse operation, your radio is super worn out and your throttle trigger doesn't like to calibrate or work normally, neutral range increasing that setting, increasing the neutral range, sorry, will, will help that. Initial throttle is the start RPM of the motor. The higher that is, the harder the motor starts, so the higher the minimum RPM is. The, so if you have a motor that's real dead on the bottom of the throttle, you can turn that up to help with that. Coast is a run-on, so if you have a real slippery track condition and you don't want any sort of deceleration of the motor, coast lets it kind of power on the motor for a little while afterwards, and that percentage turns that up or down. Mostly done for super, super slippery track conditions, oval racing, stuff like that. Drive frequency is how the speed control actually runs the motor as far as the PWM. So the higher that is, the smoother the motor is going to feel. So lower is more aggressive, higher is smoother. The softening value and the softening range are both items that are used in conjunction to give you sort of a current limiter or a traction control almost. It takes away some of the power in an amount, that's the softening percentage, through a range, that's the softening range of your throttle. So you can have uh, more or less of this feature through more or less of your throttle range. And then once you get through the throttle range, it turns off and you go back to normal power, so to speak. So it's very cool for tuning slick tracks or first time you're running modified and stuff like that or going to a very fast motor compared to a slow motor. It helps kind of crutch through that, so to speak, or be something that people use all the time. I know that when I race modified, I use that a lot drag brake is your coast brake so when you let off the throttle and go to neutral it applies brakes and makes the car slow down for most a scale racing applications you're not going to use that for drag racing you don't use that that's not what it's for you definitely don't want drag brake if you're drag racing but it's the coaster brake brake force is exactly that it's how strong the brake value is when you push the brakes on your radio so you can turn that up or down Initial brake equals drag brake. So what this does, this allows you to fine tune when you first push in the brakes. If you have this set to, oops, you can set it to a different percentage, okay? And what that lets you do is make the brakes stronger than the drag brakes are. So if you have your drag brakes set to 0% and you wanna have the brakes snap on hard, you can turn that up so that the first time it pulses the brakes, it's gonna go right to 5%. It's much like the initial throttle is, but we do equal drag brake to make it easy so that you don't have to manually adjust it. Because if you leave this at zero and you run your drag brake at 20, when you go to push on your brakes, the car will feel like it accelerates for a moment until you get up to that 20% again. So that, I don't know. I, I don't know that that needs to be explained as much, but I get asked about that. So I explain it. Brake rate is just like throttle rate. The higher it is, the more linear it is. Um, if you have very, very slick track or you have a hard time controlling how fast you mash on your brakes, lowering the brake rate will help with that. Brake curve, you can build custom ones using the app or the USB link software. Linear is the standard mode. Brake frequency, higher is smoother, a lot like the drive frequency. It's the same basic operation. It's the PWM 
that the speed control uses to operate the brakes. So the higher that is, the smoother the brakes are gonna feel. Boost timing is new. They didn't have boost timing and turbo timing in all modes in the XR8 series before. Now you get up to 48 degrees of boost timing. You also get up to 48 degrees of turbo timing and all the tunability of the turbo that was in the previous uh, setups or for the 10 scale as well. So we'll talk all about the tuning of the turbo in a later update. Just know that if you don't know about tuning of your turbo and your boost, don't mess with it. That, that's the short answer here. And you can also do full on factory restore to the default settings. And then there's more after that. You'll be able to see the profile that you're in as well as your data logging information. The speed control keeps uh, the maximum temperatures of the motor and the speed control as well as the minimum voltage that it recorded and the maximum RPM that it saw over the course of the run. So. Well, there you have it, the quick and dirty on and the setup install and usage of the Hobbywing XE Run XR8 Pro. All new and like we said, just came off a huge win at the DNC. Compliments of Ryan Mayfield. Congratulations, sir. If you do have any questions, comments, or concerns, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email. North America at Hobbywing.com. Thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you next time.